So yeah, so I'm currently a postdoc, um, as Matma mentioned, at the University of um, Adelaide. I'm working with Professor Yvonne Stokes and Dr. Brendan Harding here. Um, in my current research, I'm exploring theoretically and numerically dynamics of particle focusing in fluid flows, which has biomedical ap applications in separating particles by their size. Um, however, um, today I'll be presenting work from my PhD research. Uh, I completed my PhD from Monash uh, at the end of 2020 um, under the guidance of my supervisors, uh, Dr. Anya Slim and Associate Professor Tepio Simula. So, so today I'll be presenting some aspects uh, of my PhD research on superwalking droplets and generalized pilot wave dynamics. All right, so here is an outline of my talk. Um, so what I'll do is I'll start by introducing the system of walking droplets. Um, and then I'll introduce super walking droplets and share some experimental and numerical work that we have done to characterize super walkers. Um, and then after that, um, I'll briefly show you some videos um, from experiments of what happens when you have multiple of these super walkers interacting with each other. Uh, and then in the last part of the talk, I'll show the rich uh, dynamical behaviors that emerge in a generalized theoretical framework uh, for these droplets. And then at the end, I'll, I'll summarize the key points from the talk. <clears throat> uh, all right, so let me start by uh, introducing the system of uh, walking droplets. Uh, so back in 1831, Michael Faraday observed that when a container filled with liquid is vibrated vertically, then the free surface of the liquid can become unstable to standing waves. So these standing waves, uh, which we now know as Faraday waves, uh, they emerge above a certain threshold uh, of the driving of the bath. So below this Faraday threshold, when you vibrate the container filled with liquid, the free surface will remain flat. But if you are if you are um, vibrating vigorously, so if you are above this threshold, then the free surface becomes unstable to standing waves, and these standing waves are, are typically subharmonic waves. So they oscillate at half the frequency that you are driving them at. So now in 2005, um, Eve Scudder and colleagues in Paris showed that um, just below this Faraday threshold, uh, if you take a droplet of silicon oil, then you can make it walk on a vibrating bath of the same oil. So as you see in this video, each time the droplet bounces, um, it creates a wave around itself. So what it's doing is it's, it's exciting a damped uh, Faraday wave around itself. Then the droplet interacts with these waves on subsequent bounces to propel itself horizontally at a constant speed. So two things to note here. Um, the first is that the droplet is the one which is generating the waves. So if the droplet were to disappear, then the underlying waves would decay and the surface would become completely flat because we are below the Faraday threshold. And then uh, secondly, um, very close to the Faraday threshold, but just below it, the waves generated by the droplet, they decay very slowly in time. So what this means is that the droplet is not only influenced by the most recent wave that it generated on the previous bounce, uh, but also by the waves it generated in the distant past. So we kind of have a memory in this hydrodynamic system of walking droplets. So, so what you get uh, in the system is basically a, a, a particle as the droplet and its underlying waves. You get a wave particle entity self-propelled on the liquid surface. Now, interestingly, in this high memory regime where the droplet remembers a lot of its past waves, uh, these walking droplets or walkers, they have been shown to mimic several behaviors uh, that are typically associated with the quantum world. Um, so the first example I'll show here is um, what happens if you confine a droplet in a circular cavity. So here uh, you are seeing the trajectory of a droplet uh, confined in a circular cavity whose dimensions are of the same order of the wavelength of the waves generated by the droplet. So you can see that the droplet is undergoing this apparently chaotic looking motion um, inside the cavity. But if we were to look at the statistics uh, of this, if you were to plot a probability distribution of the position of the droplet inside this cavity, then you get this. So you get this wave-like distribution in the position of the droplet. So, so you have this underlying chaotic dynamics giving rise to a coherent wave-like statistics. Um, and these wave-like statistics, they, they are quite common and signature of, of quantum systems. Uh, another example is, uh, 
an analog of tunneling. So if you confine the droplet um, inside a cavity again, but this time the edges of the cavity are below the liquid surface, uh, the droplet will typically reflect from these edges, even though they are below the liquid surface. But sometimes the droplet can unpredictably uh, tunnel and cross these barriers and escape from the box. So you get an analog of quantum tunneling with these walking droplets. And then uh, when you fire these walking droplets at obstacles, the, the droplet will interact with the obstacles and it will deflect. So if you fire these droplets at a single slit or a double slit, uh, then what you can get is you can get diffraction and interference patterns. Now in the double slit case, um, even though the droplet is going through one of the two slits, uh, its underlying wave is going through both the slits and therefore interfering with itself. And you get these different kinds of interference patterns um, emerging. And then lastly, you can also get quantization in the droplets dynamics. So if you confine the droplet in a harmonic potential, uh, then you can get these discrete sets of orbits. And if you plot the, the curvature, the mean curvature of these orbits uh, and the mean angular momentum, then in that parameter space, you get these uh, discrete quantized states of the droplet. So, so as you see, um, these were a few examples of many different hydrodynamic analogs of both quantum and optical systems that these walking droplets exhibit. All right, so now that I've told you a little bit about these walking droplets and why they might be interesting, uh, let me now introduce uh, super walking droplets and talk about their characteristics. So, so let's quickly recap walkers. So single frequency driving gives rise to these walking droplets that are about half a millimeter to a millimeter in diameter, and they can walk uh, approximately to about 15 millimeters per second. Now, what we found um, in our experiments is that um, if you drive the bath at two frequencies, so frequency F and a frequency half of that, along with the phase difference, then surprisingly, this two frequency driving it enables walking for the bigger droplets that were unable to walk at single frequency. So you get these bigger droplets walking and they walk much faster than the single frequency driven droplets. And hence we call these super walkers. So, so these are around double the size of walkers and they can walk up to two to three times their speed. Um, now we find qualitatively two different kinds of super walkers. So we call them normal super walkers. Uh, the first kind and the second kind we call these jumbo superwalkers. So the normal superwalkers, um, as you see in this uh, video, they bounce in a very similar way uh, as walkers. Uh, they are slightly bigger, which allows them to walk much faster. So, so you have this normal superwalker, which bounces like a walker, but it walks much faster since it's bigger. Um, and then uh, what we have, the second kind, uh, are jumbo superwalkers. So now these are completely different kinds of uh, droplets because you can see that they are really huge. Um, they are hardly lifting off from the surface and they undergo these significant internal deformations as they walk. So to understand these um, superwalkers in more detail, we did some quantitative experiments. And here uh, I'm showing you the results of those experiments. So on the X axis, we have the radius of the droplet in millimeters and the y-axis is the walking speed of the droplet in millimeters per second. Now, uh, we have fixed the driving frequencies to 80 hertz and 40 hertz, um, and the amplitude of the 80 hertz driving uh, is 3.8 times gravity, so this is the acceleration amplitude. Um, and then this first set of results that I'm showing you here is for single frequency driving, so there is no amplitude of the second frequency present. So for this single frequency driving, we get walkers, and if you look at the trend, you can see that the speed of the droplet is increasing with size up to a certain point, um, and then you get a crash. So the bigger droplets, they are not able to walk, so they'll just bounce. And even bigger droplets, they can't even bounce, and they'll just coalesce or merge with the bath. So that's what happens at single frequency driving. Now, if we add a little bit of amplitude of that second frequency, then you get this black data set, which you see here. So what you see is that these bigger droplets that were only bouncing or did not even exist at single frequency, they are now walking and they're walking very fast compared to the uh, single frequency driven walkers. So you can see two different kinds of trends here, right? So you can see that um, 
In the first part, the speed increases with size up to about radius of 0.7 ish, and then the speed decreases with size. So you have an upward trend and a downward trend. Uh, now it turns out that these two trends are due to the way the droplet bounces. So the droplet bounces differently uh, in the two trends. So in that upward trend, uh, the droplets are bouncing in what we call a one to one bouncing mode. So what you see is a schematic here of the vertical motion of the droplet and the bath. So the black curve is showing you the bath motion um, and the circles is showing you the droplet motion uh, in the vertical direction as a function of time. So in this one to one mode, you can see that the droplet impacts the bath once every two up and down cycles of the bath. So that's why it's a one to one mode. Um, and that's the mode that we see uh, in this upward branch. So these droplets on the upward branch, they are all bouncing in that one to one bouncing mode. Now on the downward branch, uh, the droplet mode. So now the droplets impact the bath twice every two up and down motions. Uh, now the two bounces in one cycle are asymmetric, but you do get two bounces um, in one cycle um, in that one two two mode. So that's the bouncing mode you get on the downward branch. And then as you go further along this downward branch, then the droplet gets too big to bounce and it will just start deforming. Uh, but again, it deforms in resonance with the driving of the bath. So you get these different bouncing modes um, as you increase the, the size of the droplet. Now, uh, for these results, I fixed the, the phase difference between the two frequencies, two driving frequencies to 130. Now, it turns out that this phase difference um, does play an important role in this whole superwalking behavior. So to understand the role of phase difference, uh, what we did was we did experiments by only changing the phase difference and keeping everything else fixed. So we are fixing the driving frequencies, uh, the amplitudes, as well as the size of the droplet, and we are only changing the phase difference between the two frequencies. And as you see that uh, depending on the phase difference, you can get uh, a lot of different kinds of behaviors. So you have a bouncing regime, uh, a coalescence regime where the droplet just merges with the bath and doesn't exist at all. Uh, and then you get a superwalking regime. And then even within the superwalking regime, you get a big difference in speed uh, where, let's say near a phase difference of 90 degrees, the droplet is hardly walking. And then around 135, 140, it's walking really fast. So, so you get this really sensitive dependence on the phase difference as well of the superwalking behavior. Right, so, so after doing these experiments, there were a couple of important things that we did not fully understand. So, so the first thing was that, why is this second frequency allowing these bigger droplets to, to suddenly start walking? Um, and then the other thing was that, why, why is the whole superwalking behavior so sensitive to this uh, phase difference um, between the two frequencies? So to understand these things, uh, we simulated uh, these superwalking droplets by extending the previously established uh, theoretical models uh, for walking droplets. So I'll show you now uh, some results from the numerical simulations that we did. Uh, but before I show the results, uh, let me just explain the theoretical uh, setup uh, of the numerical model. So, so here is the, the setup. So what we have is we have a droplet uh, located uh, at xd uh, and moving horizontally with velocity x dot d. Uh, its vertical position from the undeformed bath is ZD, uh, but its vertical position from the waves directly beneath is, beneath the droplet is Z bar D. Uh, the, the disturbance of the free surface is represented by this function H of XT, um, and uh, the, the bath is vibrated vertically uh, with two frequencies uh, similar to what I showed you before in experiments. Now, uh, to, to model this, uh, this physical system, uh, we start by looking at the equation of motion uh, of the droplet in the vertical direction. So in the frame of reference of the vibrating bath, uh, we can write down an equation uh, similar to Newton's second law, so F equals MA. So on the left side, you have mass times acceleration in the vertical direction, and the right-hand side are all the forces acting on the droplet in the vertical direction. So the first force we have is gravity, uh, but since we are in the frame of the bath, which is vibrating, we have a time dependent uh, gravitational force acting here. Um, and then the second force is the force that the droplet will feel when it will impact the underlying waves. So, so this contact force between the droplet and the bath 
uh, it's modeled as a, as a spring and a damper system, and, and it's given by this equation. So, so to give you an intuition of what this equation is telling you, so this first h uh, of negative z, uh, so that's the heavy side function, and what what it's doing is it's making sure that this force only activates when the droplet contacts the bath. And then the second term here is modeling the spring and damper uh, interaction. And this max condition here is here to ensure basically that the force on the droplet from the underlying waves is always upwards. So we don't get any unphysical effects, right? So, so that's the equation of motion for the droplet in the vertical direction. Um, similarly, you can write an F equals MA type equation for the droplet in the horizontal direction. So again, in the horizontal direction, we have a inertia term, so mass times acceleration. Um, and then we have all the other forces acting on the droplet. So we have two different types of drag forces acting on the droplet. So the first uh, drag force comes from the dissipation uh, during contact. So when the droplet impacts the wave, it loses some momentum and this results uh, in a drag force. So that's captured by this yellow term. Um, and then the second source of drag comes from the air, right? As it moves through the air. So you have an aerodynamic drag um, acting on the droplet as well. And both of these are modeled as proportional to the velocity of the droplet. So that's the dissipative force. And then on the right hand side uh, is the kick uh, or the force that the droplet receives when it impacts the underlying waves. So this force that the or the kick that the droplet receives from the waves, um, it's proportional to the gradient of the waves directly beneath the droplet. So you have this uh, gradient of the wave um, coming into play. So this is the force that uh, allows the droplet to move horizontally um, as it bounces. Now, uh, this wave field uh, that gives rise to this horizontal propulsion, um, that is modeled as a sum of all the individual waves that the droplet will generate um, on each bounce. So we are summing all the individual waves the droplet generates and adding them up to get the entire wave field. Now, uh, how does that wave look like when the droplet impacts? Now that's a little complicated and you can look at the, the paper in the reference here, uh, our GFM paper, if you want to know the derivation and details. Uh, but what I'll do is I'll just give an intuition of what does each of the term represent um, in that equation. So the droplet on each bounce, it excites two different uh, subharmonic Faraday wavelengths. So if the bath is vibrating at 80 Hertz, the droplet will excite waves corresponding to 40 Hertz and 20 Hertz. Now, for both of these waves, we have an amplitude. So those are A40 and A20. Uh, we also uh, have uh, an oscillation term because these are standing waves. So they are oscillating up and down in time. Uh, the spatial form or the shape of the waves uh, are Bessel functions. Um, and then they are different wavelengths. So, so one of them is half the wavelength of the other. Um, and then these waves are decaying in time and they also have a spatial decay and uh, spread diffusively. So you have these waves that the droplets are generating um, at each bounce, and then you add all of them to get the total wave field, right? So, so that's the, the model. Uh, and then uh, before I show you the result, um, I'll just uh, explain what will be shown in the result. So I'll be showing bouncing mode plots to understand how the droplets are bouncing. And these plots are generated basically by taking a vertical slice along the center line of the droplet. So if we draw a vertical line along the center of the droplet, uh, and we track three different things. So we track the south pole of the droplet, which is here in red. Uh, we track the vertical motion of the bath in black, and we track the wave directly beneath the droplet, uh, so the height of that wave, which is this blue filled region. So if we plot these three points, uh, the vertical position as a function of time, uh, then you get this uh, bouncing mode plot. Uh, so what you see here is that whenever the red curve goes below the uh, blue region, the droplet is contacting the waves. And that is represented by this gray bar here. So, so the gray bar represents when the droplet uh, touches the wave, right? And you can see that here, the droplet is bouncing uh, such that it touches once every two up and down cycles uh, of the path. All right, so, so here are the results that we got uh, from the simulations. So this first panel A, uh, you can see that the black curve, which is the path motion is sinusoidal, right? So this is single frequency driving. Um, and the droplet is bouncing in the two one mode. So it's impacting once every two cycles. So it's skipping every second peak in the bath motion. 
And uh, so this is a walker because it's single frequency driving and it's bouncing in this nice mode and it's walking. Now, if we increase the size of the droplet, so if we look at a slightly bigger droplet, then this yellow curve, it's also more or less doing the, the same thing. Uh, it's again, skipping every second peak in the bath motion and then bouncing in the same mode. Now, if we keep on increasing the size of the droplet, then at some point, uh, the droplet loses uh, this resonance. So the, uh, the panel C here, uh, it's showing a droplet bigger than uh, panel B. Now, th this droplet is no longer able to be bound it's not able to bounce in that uh, mode where it can skip every second peak. Uh, it can't just bounce uh, that high. Uh, so it just like crashes into the next peak and it turns into this chaotic looking mode. So this, this bouncing mode in A and B, it's crucial for the droplet to walk because um, in that mode, the droplet is bouncing at half the frequency of the driving. So it can excite those Faraday waves that it needs to walk. Uh, but in panel C, since it's bouncing chaotically, it can't excite those waves. And therefore, that bigger droplet uh, can't walk. So, so if you see here, uh, the green droplet uh, and the yellow droplet are walking, but the red one is not walking uh, because it's not bouncing resonantly with the driving. Now, um, if we now add two frequency driving, uh, which is shown in panel D, then what this does is, as you see, uh, the black curve, it modifies the motion of the bath. So you create this asymmetry in the bath motion. So you can see that one peak is bigger and one is smaller. And then one is bigger, one is smaller. So what this does is, this allows the bigger droplet. So the droplet, which is shown in panel D, is the same size as panel C. But now because of that two frequency driving, uh, which lowers every second peak of the bath, it can bounce in that two one mode. So the droplet is now able to skip every second peak and be in that resonant bouncing mode, which allows the droplet to walk, right? So, so that's why you get super walkers that the two frequency driving, it, it creates this asymmetry and lowers the peak in the bath motion, which allows the bigger droplet to skip every second peak um, and, and be in that resonant bouncing mode, which is allowing it to walk. Now, uh, this fact also explains uh, why uh, we get this difference, uh, sorry, why we get this dependence on the phase difference. So if we now look at panel B, which is showing the, again, the bouncing mode plots uh, for three different phase differences. So let's start with the middle panel, which is a phase difference of 45 degrees. So if we look at the black curve here, the bath motion, uh, you can see that the bath motion is very similar to what you would expect for a single frequency driving because the two peaks are almost the same height. Uh, and therefore, the droplet is bouncing in that chaotic mode. Uh, and therefore, at 45 degrees, it's unable to walk. Now, if you look at a, a different phase difference, let's say 135 degrees, then you can see that in the black curve, we do get that asymmetry. So a bigger peak and a smaller peak. And the droplet can thus uh, be in that bouncing mode where it can skip every second peak, uh, giving rise to the super walking behavior for that phase difference. Right? So we can also understand uh, why uh, different phase differences allow superwalking or don't allow superwalking. So it, it has to do with this uh, bigger peak and smaller peak uh, created in the bath motion by the two frequency driving and then how the droplet responds to it. All right, so, so that's uh, characterizing the superwalkers. Um, now, let me show you some videos to see what happens um, when you have multiple of these superwalkers interacting with each other. Okay, so hopefully this will work. Okay, cool. All right, so what I'm showing you is, uh, I'm showing you uh, some videos from the experiments where you have multiple of these super workers interacting with each other. All right, so let's start with two of them so if the vibration amplitude is small uh, and if you have two identical super walkers then as you see they'll walk together um, as a spare uh, sorry as a pair um, and only separated by a very thin air layer uh, if you have three of them they'll form this staggered configuration where one is at the front and two behind but they'll all walk together and then four identical super walkers um, also walk together um, in this staggered configuration that you see here so that's at low uh, amplitudes of vibration. Uh, as you increase the amplitude of vibration, and if you look at that pair of droplet again, 
then it will stay bounded, but it will start performing sideways oscillations um, as it moves together. So you, what, you get what, what's called a promenading pair. And then if you have droplets, which are not the same size, so a bigger and a smaller droplet, uh, then we get this chasing pair where the bigger droplet will drag the smaller droplet um, in its wake and they'll work together uh, at, at large speeds. Um, and then you can also get uh, orbiting droplets. If you have a very large droplet at the center uh, and another smaller satellite droplet, then the smaller droplet will orbit the bigger droplet in the middle and this will sustain the bigger droplet in the middle. So if that smaller droplet weren't there, then the bigger droplet would just merge with the path and coalesce. So the smaller droplet keeps the bigger droplet alive. So, so that's what you get when you have uh, two or three or four of these droplets interacting with each other. Uh, but now you can also ask, what if you have lots of them, many of them interacting with each other? So if you have many of them, uh, then at low amplitudes of vibration, you get these crystal-like structure forming so the droplets form these aggregates um, at low amplitudes. Uh, as you increase the driving, uh, the droplets will start jiggling, but they are also still bounded um, in that um, configuration, but they'll start agitating and jiggling around. And then at very high amplitudes, that whole crystal disintegrates and the droplets start moving like billiard balls on a pool table or an ideal gas of particles. So as you can see that you get this transition from a crystal-like structure to this uh, ideal gas-like structure um, as you go from uh, low driving to high driving. Um, and then lastly, um, if the two driving frequencies are slightly detuned, so instead of driving at 80 Hertz and 40 Hertz, if I slightly detune the frequencies, so if I drive at 80 Hertz and let's say 39.5, then what the droplets do is they do this stop and go dance. So it'll, it'll walk for a while and then stop and then walk for a while and then stop and so on, right? So, so you get these um, really interesting uh, dynamical behaviors emerging when you have multiple of these droplets interacting with each other. Okay, all right, so, so before I move on um, to uh, the last part, uh, I just want to highlight that uh, if you want to create these droplets for yourself uh, and play around, or you want to use it as a demo for students, then you can create this experimental setup fairly easily. So here are a list of things that you will need. So you need a, a, a subwoofer speaker. So, so uh, a computer speaker uh, works fine. Uh, you need a Petri dish. Uh, you will need some super glue. Uh, you need a phone or a computer to input the audio signal. Um, you'll need toothpicks or, or needles to create the droplets. Um, and then you need the, the oil itself, which is uh, silicon oil. So that's the, the most expensive part um, of the whole setup. Uh, but basically what you do is um, you, you mount the Petri dish on the cone of the subwoofer uh, using super glue. Um, and then you pour the oil in the Petri dish. Um, and then you can just dip the toothpick in the liquid and then swiftly take it out and you'll start creating droplets. Um, and then to, to get the audio signal or to uh, into the speaker, uh, you can use uh, your smartphone like apps on your smartphone, um, audio signal generator apps, um, or from a computer um, to feed in the audio. Uh, and then you can visualize this whole thing just using your smartphone. So, so I created uh, such a simple setup um, using these fairly basic things. Uh, and I've just, uh, I'll just show you a video that I took just using the slow motion uh, mode on my smartphone. Um, and it turns out, um, quite well. So as so you can see that you have the Petri dish vibrating uh, uh, on the cone of a subwoofer speaker, and this is in slow motion. So the droplets are moving slowly, uh, but you can capture the bouncing quite well. Um, yep, so, so, so that's, you can create this setup fairly easily to, to look at these droplets in a qualitative way. Uh, now, of course, in the experimental results I showed you, uh, I created a, a, a little bit more sophisticated setup so I could get good quality uh, quantitative data as well. Um, in fact, one of my PhD supervisors, uh, Tapio Simila at Swinburne University, has recently built a, a whole lab, a proper setup to study these uh, walking droplets. And he's also currently offering uh, projects uh, for these walking droplets in, in, in all aspects, so experimental, numerical, and theoretical. So yes, if, if you're interested or if you know anyone else who's interested, who would be interested in these um, droplets as a project, then feel free to reach out to me and I can get you in touch with him. Uh, all right, uh, so 
let me move on to the last section of the talk, uh, where I'll talk about the, the rich dynamics that you get uh, in a theoretical framework of these uh, walking droplets. All right, so um, a simplified model that captures the key aspects of the walking uh, in the horizontal direction um, can be obtained if we take that previous model I presented, and if we just average over the vertical motion of the bath. All right, so, so, you, you, so it's the same um, model as before, but you, you average over the vertical motion uh, of the droplet um, and you only look at the horizontal motion. So now experimentally, uh, what this looks like is that if you imagine taking only one picture of the droplet per bounce, uh, and then running a movie, then uh, it will look like this, right? So the droplets, uh, you won't see the bouncing, you'll only see the horizontal walking. And this is what, the mo what this model is essentially doing. So this equation, which you see here, uh, is the same equation as I presented for the horizontal motion before, uh, but it's uh, averaged over the vertical dynamics of the droplet. And it's also in a, in a non-dimensional form. So that's why it looks a little bit different, but you have the same terms as before. So you have uh, the inertia term on the left-hand side. So mass times acceleration. So you can think of that parameter kappa as a dimensionless mass parameter. Um, you have the wave force, uh, which we had before, which was proportional to the gradient of the waves um, beneath the droplet. So uh, the, the waves generated by the droplet are typically modeled as Bessel functions. Um, so that's why you have a Bessel function uh, appearing here. Uh, and then instead of summing the waves that we did before, we are now integrating over all the past waves. Uh, and that's because uh, since the bouncing is very fast compared to the walking, uh, you, can, you can approximate the whole system as the droplet continuously generating waves as it moves rather than discreetly. So you have that uh, propulsion force um, as integration of all the waves over the history of the droplet. Um, and you also have the drag force uh, as before, proportional to the velocity. Now you don't see the coefficients here because um, it's a non-dimensional. This is a non-dimensional equation, so it's been uh, averaged over, and then uh, the parameters have gone into the dimensionless parameters kappa and beta. So yeah, so kappa is a dimensionless mass parameter, and beta uh, it quantifies the strength of the force that the droplet feels from the wave. So that's a wave force parameter. So yeah, you get this. Uh, nice integral differential equation with uh, two parameters that describes the, the motion of these walking droplets or, or wave particle entities um, in two dimensions. So that's for a single droplet in two dimensions. Now you can extend this model um, for two interacting wave particle entities. So what you need is, so you, you already have the term we had before, uh, which in captures the, the effect of the droplet's own wave um, on itself. Um, and then you also need a term which takes into account the, the interaction term. So how do the uh, neighboring droplets wave are influencing the droplet, right? So you get this um, two, you get this extra interaction term. And then at the end, you'll get a coupled system of integral differential equation, which will describe the, the motion of the droplet. And then uh, if you simulate these two equations, then this is what you get in the parameter space of kappa and beta. So you can see that you get a, a wide range of rich dynamical behaviors for a pair of droplets. So, so let me, let me uh, show you some of them. So, so the, the most basic one you get are stationary pairs. So the two droplets are just remaining stationary uh, a certain distance apart. Um, and then you can get inline oscillation. So the droplet starts oscillating back and forth towards and away from each other. Uh, they can start walking side by side, uh, like we saw in that experimental video. Uh, they can start oscillating sideways um, as they walk side by side, so like the promenading pair. Uh, you can also get tight orbits. Uh, you can also get more complicated behaviors where, for example, if you look at this discrete turns, the droplets are walking for a while, and then they'll turn discreetly at almost 90 degrees and then turn for a while, and then do kind of like a random walk. So you can get a, a rich set of dynamical behaviors uh, coming out from the model. And, and this is what I meant by a generalized uh, theoretical frameworks that we are not restricting the parameters of the model to what you can see in experiments, but you are allowing, um, you are allowing a, a broader exploration by exploring all the, uh, or an extended parameter space. So not restricting to what you see in experiments, but allowing for other parameter values as well and seeing what type of behaviors that you get. All right, so, so let's go back 
to a single droplet rather than two droplets. And let's also go to a simpler case of one dimension rather than two dimensions. So we again have that same equation, but it's a little bit simplified equation because we are looking at a single droplet, a single wave particle entity in one dimension. So you have the same term. So you have an inertia uh, drag um, and the wave force, but it's now uh, a single droplet in one dimension. And what we have also allowed is uh, we are not restricting the waves to be the same as what you see in experiments. So in experiments, you see a Bessel function wave, but now we allow a, a general wave, uh, A of X, um, to be uh, in the model. So, so we are generalizing or relaxing that condition that the wave has to be a Bessel function. It could be any wave that the droplet is generating. Um, now, if we do indeed use a Bessel function wave and see what happens in the model, um, then uh, you, you get really interesting behaviors. So again, in that parameter space of kappa and beta, uh, for most part, you get this yellow region, which corresponds to a steadily moving droplet. Now, that's, that's what we see in experiments, um, and that's expected. Uh, but what's not expected and what we see is that for small kappa and large beta, um, the, the steady walking droplet becomes unstable, and you get this unsteady region in the parameter space. Now, in this unsteady region, uh, most of it is filled with this blue color. So this blue color represents an irregular walking droplet. So this is a droplet that will walk in one direction for a while and then switch directions, and then walk in one direction and then switch directions in an irregular way. So you get this random walk-like behavior um, of the droplet uh, in this unsteady regime. And then uh, in this unsteady regime, uh, there are also small isolated islands of periodic behavior. So you get this orange behavior where the droplet is oscillating back and forth with a net drift. So it's going, doing back and forth, but it's drifting in one direction. Um, and then you also get this dark blue uh, region where the droplet is just doing back and forth, but not moving at all. So the droplet traps itself under its own wave field and just does back and forth oscillations. All right, so that's what you get with the Bessel wave field. Now, if you look at a Bessel wave field, it has two key features. So the first is that it has oscillations. Um, and the second is that it decays far away from the center peak. Now, if we ignore the decay aspect and only capture the, the oscillations of the wave, then uh, we, we can replace the Bessel wave field with a much simpler function, uh, a sinusoidal wave field, which also has oscillations. And if we run the model with a sinusoidal wave field, then this is what we get. So again, in that parameter space, we get all the same types of behaviors that we got for the Bessel wave field. Uh, however, the, the region occupied by each of that behavior changes because uh, we don't have that spatial decay, but we do capture all the different behaviors uh, that were there in the Bessel wave field. Now, you might ask, why, why, what's the point of using a sinusoidal wave field? Well, it turns out that if you use a sinusoidal wave field um, in the equation, uh, it makes the equation much simpler. So the integral differential equation of motion with the sinusoidal wave field uh, can be transformed into a finite system of ordinary differential equations. And ordinary differential equations are easier to deal with than the integral differential equations. And, and what's more surprising is that uh, the sinusoidal wave field, the set of ordinary differential equations that you get out of this are in fact the, the classic Lorentz equation. So the Lorentz system. Right? So, so you get this uh, exact mapping from the droplets equation of motion um, to Lorentz system. So, so the x variable in the Lorentz system will be the droplets velocity, the y variable will be the, the wave force, and then the z variable is also related to the wave forcing. So you get this nice correspondence between the two systems, and uh, the parameters in the Lorentz system, sigma r and b, are also related to the kappa and beta in the droplet system. Right, so if you get this one-to-one um, uh, -one correspondence between the droplets motion um, and the Lorentz system. And this might be interesting, right? Uh, because uh, in, as I presented uh, at the start in the hydrodynamic quantum analogs, where you get uh, wave-like statistics emerging from the underlying chaos, um, it's, it's good uh, that we have such a system like this one where you know that the chaos is coming from the Lorentz system and Lorentz system is widely studied and, and quite well understood. So if the underlying chaos in the walking droplet motion can be related to these known chaotic attractors, then that might help in rationalizing the, the emerging quantum-like statistical features um, that are observed in experiments. 
All right, so in conclusion, um, two frequency driving at, at a frequency and half of it with a phase difference, it introduces this asymmetry in the motion of the bath, uh, which results in these bigger droplets uh, being able to work and they work much faster. So these are super workers. Um, and then interaction of these super workers um, results in really rich dynamical behaviors. Um, and then um, if we don't restrict the model to the experimental parameters and uh, explore in a, in a more generalized way, then we can get even more rich dynamical behaviors. And lastly, uh, it seems like there are interesting connections between the equation of motion uh, of the droplet um, and uh, classic chaotic systems like, like the Lorentz-like system um, of ordinary differential equations. Um, that's it. Thank you. Thank you for listening.